Hey, how's it going, folks? Welcome to Found Flix. On this ending explain, we've got a pretty out there one for you. Come true. Following a teenage runaway that takes part in a sleep study that becomes a nightmarish descent into the depths of her mind and a frightening examination of the power of dreams. This one was quite a pleasant surprise for me to discover. You know, especially the past year, I've been watching tons of stuff on streaming, a lot of which I'd never heard of before. Same for it come true. And I was delightedly blown away by how unique and well done it was. I was even more impressed when I found out the director, Anthony Scott Burns, also wrote the script, shot it, and did the soundtrack with his band. I was like, dang boy, that is a wide range of talents there. I'm sure that's at least partially due to budgetary reasons, but this also impressively never feels low budget, and in particular, visually come true really excels. It's all extremely well composed and constructed, drawing us into its dreamlike strangeness. Though there's one specific aspect that really stuck with me. What I started calling the nightmare tableaus. At many points, we enter into Sarah's dreams, and the way it's represented is just cool. It's in this kind of floating, moving, ever-forward POV thing, passing through dark and weird environments, then ultimately coming to a creepy shadow dude. Every time, I was like, whoa, that is some good-looking and quite creepy stuff. As far as the story, it's what I consider kind of a thinking man's horror sci-fi film, because there is a ton that is left completely up to interpretation by the viewer about what it all means, and it's one of those that leads to long debates about how to connect the dots after watching, and I just love that kind of stuff. And at least in that capacity, it reminded me of Possessor a little bit, also Canadian. Then there's the ending itself that perhaps feels frustratingly simple after all the weird stuff that's been happening. It does feel kind of like a, oh, okay then, kind of moment. But to me, this does not undo everything up to that point, and there's lots to look at when it comes to everything else that happens and what it means under the surface, not just the ending itself and its implications. A lot of this touches on the work of philosopher Carl Jung. Trust me, it is the whole thing. So dust off your intro to philosophy books, and let's dive into the nightmarish world of Come True, breaking down the story, including the arc of our protagonist Sarah, investigating its many dangling questions, and explaining the ending. We fade in on a dark mountain, sort of floating ever closer, then consumed by darkness. There's a muddy ground, and ominous thumps continuing to hurl forward. We float through a door that creaks open. Important to note as a door in dreams often represents the opening of new possibilities and challenges in the future, which we'll see is very important to Sarah's story. We come to a black shadowy figure with her head down facing away. Sarah then shoots awake, sleeping outside on a playground, obviously having fallen on some pretty hard times. Then our first of four Jungian titles appears on screen, the persona, each referring to an archetype that makes up our personalities. So let me hand it over to our in-house expert, Professor Foundflix. Hello there. Professor Foundflix, at your service. Our first title is the Persona, also known as a mask. It is the outward face that we present to the world. It is to conceal our real self sort of a public face or personality a person presents to others, but isn't who we really are. Sarah waits outside of her friend Zoe's house for her mom to leave, putting away in an old Cadillac. She seizes a chance to take a shower, a Weekend at Bernie's poster on the wall. Not sure how many 18 year olds are big fans of that one. She also is struggling with insomnia, or really sleeping at all, barely able to stay conscious during class, and passes out later in the library. Zoe at least appears to be a source of friendship and safety for her, when they meet bringing up asking her mom to let her stay at her house for a while, but is worried about what she's going to do tonight. It seems even if she is sneaking around all the time, Zoe's mom has some idea of what's up, nearly catching her on another visit to clean up and get food. Nowhere else to go, she's back to her slide on the playground, huddling in the cold, staring up at the stars until sleep takes its hold. There's a broken seesaw, then another white door with ornate designs creaks open. We pass through a flash of light, more figures floating at the walls, waves of light continuing to flash by. We enter what looks like a sewer, coming to the shadow figure in the middle, columns all around. This time it's facing us, getting right up on its darkened visage, and Sarah is scared awake back in class. While getting some coffee with Zoe, she stumbles upon a fortuitous potential answer to her problem. A flyer there for a sleep study, boasting that you can earn money while you can sleep for 12 bucks an hour. So she bikes to the nondescript facility, called in by one scientist, Anita. She has her fill in some forms and ask some basic questions, like does she have difficulty staying or falling asleep? Uh, yeah, that's why I'm here, lady. 
anxiety. As for any specific sleep disorders, she says she's never officially been diagnosed, but actually used to sleepwalk years ago as a child, although has not in quite some time. Back with Zoe, Sarah is distant, but shrugs it off when pressed, saying that she's just fine. And when it comes to when this is set, she has a laptop, so again, I'm like, what modern teenager loves Weekend at Bernie's? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe all the kids nowadays are huge Andrew McCarthy and Jonathan Silverman fans. Point being, something is fishy already here time period wise. She's just thankful for being in a bed, in a house, getting tucked in on the floor. She dreams, but actually looks still awake with her eyes open. The shadow now upside down and suddenly kind of melts away into nothing. We continue flying underneath another, coming to a glowing round hole. There's a desk with paintbrushes entering another cavern. The shadow waiting there too. This actual confrontation each time appearing to be what always shocks her out of her dream. We're given our next title, The Anima and the Animus. Respectively, each represents the mirror image of our biological sex. The unconscious feminine side in males, anima, and the masculine tendencies in women, animas. Now, trying to get into a whole gender thing here is merely the concept as conceived in the 1900s. At the facility, she meets the rest of the group in the sleep study, including two dudes that go way back. One guy, Will, has been coming to things like this since he was five years old. In the room, there's some quite antiquated looking equipment attached to the walls, and Sarah is stuffed into a strange suit with Anita's help explaining that the suit is how they get the information from her to the control room. She then sticks on a kind of marshmallowy looking helmet on her head, as they're joined by the other female in the study, Emily. She's curious why there's more guys than girls, but Anita is tight-lipped. Same goes for what it is exactly that they're studying. Secret secrets, Anita! In the control room, the head of the program, Dr. Meyer, and his right-hand man, Jeremy, stare into several monitors, one for each patient's input, appearing as though they are going to be watching their dreams somehow. Meyer describes each stage of sleep. The final stages being REM sleep, where you have the deepest of dreams, but also warns if they were to wake them then, for a moment they will have no idea where they are. So for now they wait, as each in the group gradually fall into deeper unconsciousness. Tons of data is being spit out by the various antique machinery, Lyle noticing that they're all kind of sync. Myers chirping in, yes, for most it is. They then start recording, and already see something intriguing, learning that it's from Sarah's feed, her eyes flittering behind the lids. In the morning, she's asked how she slept compared to at home, and she sighs in relief that she for the first time in a while actually feels well rested. She later sits by the river reading a book, intruded upon by a call from her mom. Without hesitation, she ignores it. Hmm, must be something going on there, huh? She peruses a bookstore shelves, and a bearded dude can't help but bring up that she needs to read the Philip K. Dick book that she pulls out. He calls it stuff that will really make you think, now seeing his face in focus. <gasps> Daniel Radcliffe? No, not really. His, uh, his Canadian equivalent. Sarah and Zoe attend a screening of Night of Living Dead, and it looks like Sarah has a stalker on her hands, Jeremy taking a seat a few rows up. Oh, and by the way, you already missed most of the movie. Afterwards, she explains the situation to Zoe as he walks the other way, her playfully teasing that she likes him. Time for more sleeping, so she's strapped back into her suit and put to bed, but is curious about Emily's whereabouts. She's assured that these things happen all the time, telling her goodnight. Sarah stares at the camera, eyeing her, and it's Jeremy solo at the console now. In her dream, the lights overhead blip erratically, revealing more floating figures. She enters another doorway back out onto a rocky surface. A figure stands, and we go right through them. A statue is seen on a table, coming to more bodies splayed out in unnatural positions. There's a brief flash of what looks like that same statue, as well as more figures, which wakes her up, terrified. The scientist extracts several frame captures from her dreams, asking for her reaction and what she can remember. Yet she doesn't remember anything, until getting to a shot of the ghoulish shadow, sending her immediately into a panic-induced seizure. They run to fetch Jeremy, only adding to Sarah's trauma, knowing that he's a part of this, sobbing no when seeing him. They then have an awkward coffee, Jeremy promising that he wasn't following her. She isn't buying it. Well, then why am I seeing you everywhere? He only shakes his head in response, so she keeps accusing him of potential immoral intentions here. You watched me sleep and thought it was your best chance to find a future Mrs. Nerd, and maybe if you followed me around, I'd fall for your nerd charms. He asks her to not quit because of him. Her firing back, she's quitting because she's had the worst panic attack of her life, and no one will tell her why. Myers sees the footage of Sarah for himself and is perturbed by his colleague's irresponsible methods. He cautions about the importance of how to proceed with things. This is the first time that any 
anyone has done this, and puts his foot down to follow his methods that he laid out going forward. She defends herself that all they wanted to see was if they do remember, Meyer pointing out they obviously do, you dumbo. At the laundromat, Sarah blankly watches her clothes swirling in the dryer, spotting a shadow figure on the wall behind her, the figures now appearing in the supposed real world. She doesn't notice, her gaze training outside. Her phone rings, assumedly it's Zoe, but she can't hear anything on the line to her confusion. Hearing creaking sounds, Sarah stares up at something in absolute terror and starts seizing again. The light's blinking frantically and she passes out. An old, possibly blind woman wakes her up, informing her that some boys have stolen her phone. She runs out, but they're long gone, falling to her knees in frustration. Hoping for support from her pal, she bikes over to her house in a hurry, knocking and ringing on the bell several times, but it's looking like Zoe ain't home. With no other choice, she returns to the facility, sneaking up to Jeremy, yelling out, Hey nerd! He's cagey at first about giving her any deeper information about those pictures, but she basically blackmails him that she won't come back until he spills some deets. He's concerned, showing her could compromise the results. Firing back, his experiment is fucking her up, and he finally relents to her deal. He attaches the helmet to himself, explaining the backstory of the technology. A few years back, it was discovered how to decode what a mind process is, creating a visual representation of this data as a moving image. On the monitor, we see it is definitely him, waving his hand in front of Sarah's face, but a bit lo-fi. Sarah smirking, so cool. Oh, and a Terminator 1 poster there, another odd choice time frame wise. I see you, Burns. It was Jeremy who tweaked the tech for another purpose, to watch our dream, Sarah realizes, beaming ear to ear. He's worried about showing her her own dream, but instead cues up another, seeing someone falling to sleep, represented by patterns of rotating squares. He refers to this as a hypnagogic experience. It's his brain beginning to lose consciousness. Pictures and shapes start to form in his mind, but Jeremy recalls that he had a scary dream right off the bat, so they might need to cut things short. It fades into the same rocky floor, seeing several beds there. A hand reaches out, clutching an egg, as we ascend a flight of stairs, encountering two statues with arms outstretched, more beds surrounding it on very long poles. There's a child's tricycle, then a jack-in-the-box cranking out an eerie tune. Their attention is turned to the side, a figure's face surprising them there, the nightmare that he warned of. But it's also, interestingly, someone else having the same shadow appear in their nightmare, just like Sarah's. Taking it all in, she calls this nuts, but then does consider the moral implication here. Isn't it a little skeezy to watch people dream, especially without them knowing? He counters vaguely that he wouldn't do it without a reason, and is cut short before he can elaborate further. Footsteps heard out in the hall, and they have to bail in a hurry. <clears throat> Our next stage is the shadow, appropriately. Been seeing shadows all over this fucking thing. The animal side of a personality. It is the source of both our creative and destructive energies, known as the id, in Freud talk. Per her deal with Jeremy, she returns to a place in the study, and it's back to sleep along with the others. Light strobe, venturing through strange formations, twisting and floating down a staircase, going potentially underwater? The shadow is there, motionless as always. Jeremy catches it on his monitor, and fiddles with some knobs to clean up the image a bit. The rest of the group instantly entranced. Anita whispers in disbelief, how is this happening? Because we see everyone is having a dream of that same shadow figure. As it's laid out, we all do have unique aspects to dreaming, but eventually all end up like this. Jeremy revealing that he too has seen this same creature since he was six years old. And there's been records of similar things for years, but has always been discounted as unfounded and unbelievable. The whole idea here is of the collective unconscious. This concept refers to part of the unconscious mind, which is derived from ancestral memory and experience common to all humankind, distinct from the individual's own unconscious. Essentially, there are memories that all humans share and the shadow showing up in each dream is an example of this, a primordial fear that we all share of this same shadow. He barks too loud to get the frame in 4K, and I'm like, this stuff does 4K? Are you kidding me? Look at that grainy ass image. An alert starts beeping, and Sarah starts to convulse, coming out of rim, they say. She pants awake, breathing heavily. She's had enough, ripping off her suit, growling to Anita that she hates this place. She attempts to calm her down, telling her it's just a nightmare, but Sarah divulges that she knows the truth about what she's up to here, knowing that she she can see the shadows too. Sarah goes to leave and Anita stops her, mumbling your eye, seeing that she's bleeding from one of them. Alone, Meyer stares at the same shadowy figure from the footage, seeing that he has jotted down notes about its particular characteristics. Sarah furiously pedals through curiously empty streets, Jeremy trailing her in his car. He luckily spots her, chaining up her ride, sprinting off to a nearby club. She must be a regular here, knowing the bouncer Bill, and asking if Zoe is around. Things grow more intense in their absence at the facility, both dudes starting to wake up. But they 
they begin hyperventilating with their eyes now open. Meyer enters, everyone suddenly silent, asking what is going on? At the club, Sarah searches everywhere for her pal, beginning to get overwhelmed. She braces herself on a fence. It runs past the lengthy bathroom line, blowing chunks in the toilet. She's discovered unconscious by Jeremy, who carries her out in his arms, passing by Zoe dancing with some guy, so I guess she was there after all. The science gang asks about Jeremy's whereabouts, not wanting him to miss this, exclaiming that this is what he's been waiting for. The bros keep breathing heavily, a shadow appearing in the room near their beds, the shadow now really appearing in our own world, which is, you know, probably not good. They press on, thanks to Meyer's encouragement, needing data to prove the connection to this so-called icon, the unified fear of this shadow with eyes. They send someone in silently to reconnect their sync devices, and both begin to convulse. The image goes fuzzy, and both shoot up, wide-eyed like the laundromat lady, and the equipment glitches out, the gang staring on on pins and needles. We then come to our final archetype, the self. The self provides a sense of unity and experience. To Jung, the ultimate aim of every individual is to achieve a state of selfhood, or really reconciling with the other stages of oneself up to this point, ultimately unifying into one realized being. Back in the dream realm, things continue to get stranger. A beam of light appears, focusing in on a drawn square on the wall. We're then coming out of a cave, the walls closing in actually looking like claws or teeth. Entering through a gravestone, we're in a mortuary. There's a statue of a man going right through a black square. There's pools of water on the craggy ground, lights continuing to blink above. The shadow stands on a rocky structure, going right in on its glowing eyes. Sarah awakes in a new environment, Jeremy's apartment, now sporting an eye patch on her previously bleeding one. She encounters a glowing machine covered in a tarp. She removes the patch, her eye now black and bloodshot. Yeah, let's put that back on for now. She finds Jeremy strapped in bed, pillows covering the whole wall behind him. Based on the setup here, it sure looks like he has a quite severe sleepwalking problem. He's wearing his own dream helmet, transmitting to a glorified VHS recorder. She returns to the machine and dials into the video feed of his dream. Jeremy begins to fall unconscious, and then images start to take shape. He's driving a car, looking over to Sarah in the passenger seat. He then comes to her in a void facing away. She dons a pair of shades, blood dribbling from her lips, seeing in the reflection that he has a set of vampire fangs, and she smiles with a pair herself. They embrace and kiss, spinning in the void, then dissolving into particles, the dream interrupted by Jeremy waking up. The feed continues, here too seeing a shadow looming over the foot of the bed in the waking world. She rushes to wake him up, and manages to do so right as the shadow approaches him. He shouts himself awake, giving her a casual hey when he is finally back to reality. They go for a bite, Jeremy creepily eyeing Sarah as she scarfed down a sandwich, neither uttering a word. She suddenly gets emotional and excuses herself, again removing the bandage, but the eye is looking much better now. She returns asking if she can crash on his couch tonight, and of course he's down. I mean, he just had the whole vampire hump fantasy dream thing. Uh, yeah, sure, you can stay over. She does bring up seeing this herself, both stone-faced at the obvious tension, and it's right into boning. As they get it on, all dreamy and weird, things grow unsettling when two shadows appear over Jeremy's shoulders. Sarah gets upset and passes out, and he backs away, shrouded in shadow, and gets Sarah some help. It seems it's not too good either, her being wheeled off in an ambulance to the hospital. They do an MRI, an anxious Jeremy waiting by her bedside, her still unconscious. In the nightmare, glowing eyes pierce the darkness. A telephone rings, the same omnipresent light blinking. A large, almost submarine-like door opens, and the shadow is on the other side of some plastic. We then fade into to another hall, what really resembles a hospital. Lights blink at the end of the hall, the shadow revealed, with multiple limbs looking quite terrifying. This time it's Jeremy rather than Sarah's dream that we're awoken from. Things are still off, however, as the entire floor now looks empty, him shouting for help futilely as he runs down the halls. He manages to find a nurse, inquiring about Sarah's location, her informing him that she's still in room 237. Nice little shining reference there. She writes off the oddities as just being all due to a staff shortage asking him to wait until they can get things sorted. He sits still all of two seconds before wandering around, and happens upon the security camera room, catching Sarah out in the garage sleepwalking. As we recall, she mentioned this being a childhood problem, but hasn't been for many years. Jeremy finds her, unresponsive at his attempts to wake her. He even grabs Sarah, her only grunting back, before continuing to slowly walk on undisturbed. He rings a pissed off Anita, asking for her help, her complaining that she's been cleaning up his mess since he vanished. He promises he needs just one more thing and we're done. Then we're done, she agrees. Sarah continues sleepwalking for what seems like hours, and Anita finally finds them bringing some helpful belongings, like slippers and a 
a jacket for Sarah, along with a mobile monitor to watch her dreams. Anita verifies their plan to wake her up at the height of her nightmare. He's confident that this will work. The body tries to reject death and dreams, so you wake up. Sarah going through another dream door. Anita is growing concerned how long they're going to let this go on, just as Sarah goes off the main road into an overgrown field, as though she knows exactly where she's going after all. They're now on a dirt path in the foggy woods. Even Jeremy is confused, thinking that she was going somewhere familiar. Anita stops him, seeing shadows are flanking them on both sides of the dream. Jeremy notes that he hasn't seen this many before. Rows and rows of the dudes revealed. He reiterates that when one gets close, she should wake up as we've seen so far. The shadows end, and they reach an ominous large building that comes into view. Confused by a nearby cell phone chime, Jeremy goes to investigate as Sarah enters large column halls. Approaching a white beaming light, Jeremy swipes the phone call from an unknown number away, causing a weird error on the screen, and the dream light goes black. Sarah screams and is woken up just as he theorized. She's confused, asking what happened, him explaining that they couldn't wake her. You saw, she cries, referencing all the shadows. Yes, he croaks and apologizes, giving her a hug. The trio silently head back out of the woods, Sarah still dazed, and Anita on edge, uncertain that they are heading the right way. He pulls out the phone, and Sarah immediately snatches it away, claiming it as being her missing one. You lost it out here, he asks, confused. And even more bafflingly, Sarah says that she's never been here before. Anita thinks that perhaps she had an episode like this prior, but Sarah cuts her off, asking the time. The time showing as 0.0, .0 then glitching to 10.01. Jeremy is alarmed arm too when checking his watch, grumbling, what the fuck? A branch cracks amongst the dark foliage, seeing glowing eyes starting to appear. Run! Sarah orders, the three breaking into a full sprint. Anita is quickly snatched away, followed moments later by Jeremy. Sarah stops, turning back, unable to see anything around her beyond what her phone light provides. Hearing more rustling and breaking branches, she stares ahead and gasps, the glowing shadow eyes right in front of her. She wakes up back at Jeremy's, seeing that she has jammed his eyeballs out, her hands and body Body caked in blood. She tears up in realization of her apparent murder and goes back to the mirror, staring at a reflection, really confronting herself, so to speak. Her phone beeps with an incoming message. She stares at it and starts to gently laugh, returning to her reflection. She opens her mouth, revealing fangs, just as in Jeremy's dream fantasy, and starts to really laugh incredulously. We see the message for ourselves, reading, you've been in a coma for almost 20 years. We are trying a new technique. We don't know where this message will end up in your dream, concluding to please wake up. Wow, so yeah, lots to explain here. Strap in, everybody. This is one that has so many questions for me, it's like a bullet, like one by one, getting all this thing sorted. First of all, the conclusion in the end is that Sarah has been in a coma for nearly 20 years, and everything that we've been seeing is all kind of in her head in a dream reality to an extent. Then there's the specific wording of the final message from the outside world. This is actually a meme, which is sort of hilarious to me. The earliest example I could find was from back in 2014 but the wording is pretty much exactly the same. I'm not sure the meaning behind this particular choice by the filmmaker, but it is definitely a choice. So this explains the kind of anachronistic nature of things with old equipment alongside modern laptops and cell phones, because when Sarah first fell into her coma, it was 20 years ago. But also, at least to some extent, the changing outside world did seep through into her mind, which seems to be at least part of the bigger point here. They're trying to find a way to get Sarah out of her decades-long coma, and that is the purpose of the final message, to attempt to break through to her dreams, all via the out-of-play cell phone. The phone, to me, acts as a kind of gateway between the modern day out-of-the-dream world and her own coma reality due to how it acts in the story. First, it's the kids who supposedly steal it, but then it's found outside the weird shadow building, and it's specifically by answering the phone that Sarah wakes up from her sleepwalking, as though it was almost really planned out in a way, trying to trigger specific things to get Sarah to finally wake up, activating the first step with the call. Same goes for the final message. It's through the phone that they are able to reveal what Sarah is experiencing with the whole coma thing. All in particular to me, thanks to it not really actually belonging to the time Sarah initially went into the coma. There's a few other clues about this, like as she gets deeper into the dreams, the environment really does start to resemble a hospital. Like the overhead lights that illuminate the floating shadows, those look like fluorescent overheads that you would see there. And even the ever-flashing light really could be a pin light scanning her pupils for activity, especially based on its particular movements later. Point being, they're trying to get her out of the coma. But conversely to all of that, she's been experiencing what is essentially her own Jungian journey to self-actualization. We've actually been following her through each stage of this in our story. Even if technically all part of her coma dream world, I do believe that there is some kind of semblance of reality 
value being presented here as well. We start off in the persona. Before going to the study, Sarah is suffering from sleep issues and also kind of some estrangement with her mother, possibly some kind of drama. I mean, she's not dead or anything like that. Whatever it is, she'd rather sleep on a playground than deal with it. She's kind of running from her problems here and keeping that face or mask up of things being normal, where she starts her journey as a character. But things continue advancing, and particularly with the anima animus archetype. To me, I feel like in real life, things again continue to kind of mirror the dream world. And so Jeremy could have certainly been a real doctor that she had a burgeoning relationship with. However, in my interpretation of the events in the coma, is that he represents that dormant masculine side of Sarah, the animus. They do have quite contrasting personalities, with Jeremy usually being collected and reserved, while Sarah is much more brash and loudspoken. To continue this through line to the final stage, the self, it is by Sarah killing the animus that she reconciles with her own self, achieving self-actualization as a result. All sides of her personality now working in unity together. In relation to her having fangs as well, this is literally her becoming that dream or fantasy version of herself that was in Jeffrey, well, actually her dream. That's the conclusion of her journey in her state of unconsciousness. Whether she ultimately chooses to leave the coma or not due to the message is obviously up for debate, but it seems like based on this final outcome that since she found herself, she won't be interested in going anywhere. Hopefully that all makes sense. And that brings us to the conclusion of this in-depth explain video for Come True. Sorry if things got a little heady there, but that's just the way she goes sometimes, especially when you get Carl Jung involved and all that stuff. I dug this one quite a bit and look forward to see what else Anthony Scott Burns will be putting together in the future. Because this one was really just my style, you know? And don't forget, before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you guys think of Come True and its ending? Do you have a different interpretation or theory than mine? Leave your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.